Chapter 90, The Meeting After Mercedes had left Monte Cristo, a gloomy shadow seemed to overspread everything. Around him and within him, thought appeared stopped. His energetic mind slumbered, and thus the body after extreme fatigue. What, said he to himself, while the lamp and the wax lights were nearly burned out, and the servants were waiting impatiently in the ante room. What, this edifice which I have been so long preparing, which I have spread with so much care and toil, is to be crumbled by a single touch, a word, even a slight breath. Yes, this self, of whom I thought so much, of whom I was so proud, who had appeared so worthless in whom, in the dungeons of the Chateau d'If, and whom I had succeeded in making so great, will be but a clump of clay tomorrow. Alas, it is not the death of the body I regret, for that destruction of the vital principle is it not the rest to everything it's tending, to which everything unhappy beings aspires, the repose of matter after which I so long signed, and which I was seeking to obtain by the painful process of starvation when Faria appeared in my dungeon, what is death for me but one step more toward repose? No, it is not existence. Then, that I regret, but the ruin of our projects, so slowly carried out, so laboriously framed, providence is now opposed to them. When I most thought it would be propitious, it is not God's will they should be accomplished. This burden, almost as heavy as the world, which I had raised, and I had thought to hear to the end, was too great for my strength, and I was compelled to lay it down in the middle of my career. Oh, I shall, oh, shall I then again become a fatalist, whom fourteen years of despair and the ten years of hope had rendered a believer in providence, and all this, all this because of my heart, which I thought dead, was only sleeping, because it has awoke and has been beaten again. Because I have yielded to the pain of the emotion excited in my breast by a woman's voice. Yet, continued the Count, coming each moment more absorbed in the anticipation of the dreadful sacrifice of the morrow, which Mercedes had accepted. Yet, it is impossible that so noble minded a woman should thus, through selfishness, consent to my death when in the prime of life and strength. Is it possible she can carry to such a point maternal love, or rather delirium? There are virtues which become crimes by exaggeration. No, she must have conceived some pathetic scene. She will come and throw herself between us, and what would be sublime here will appear there ridiculous. The blush of pride mounted to the count's forehead as this thought passed through his mind. Ridiculous? repeated he, and the ridicule will fall on me. I am ridiculous. No, I would rather die. Thus exaggerating to his own mind the anticipated ill fortune of the next day, to which he had condemned himself by promising Mercedes to spare her son, the Count at last exclaimed, Folly, 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 to carry generosity so far as to place myself as a mark for that young man to aim at. He will never believe my death was a suicide, and yet it is important for the honor of my memory. And this, surely, is not vanity, but a justifiable pride. It is important the world should know that I have consented, by my free will, to stop my arm, already raised to strike, and that with a man, oh, and that with that arm, so powerful against others, I have struck myself. It must be, it shall be. Seizing a pen, he drew a paper from the secret drawer, in his peru and traced at the bottom of the paper, which was no other than his will, made since his arrival in Paris, a sort of codicil, clearly explaining the nature of his death. I do this, O oh my God, said he, with his eye raised to heaven, as much for thy honor as for mine. I have during ten years considered myself agent of thy vengeance, and it must not be that wretches, like a morsel, a dangler, a Villefort, even that more serve himself, shall imagine that chance has freed them from their enemy. Let them know, on the contrary, 
that their punishment, which had been decreed by Providence, is only delayed by my present determination. Although they escape it in this world, it awaits them in another, and they are only exchanging time for eternity. While he was thus agitated by these gloomy uncertainties, these wretched waking dreams of grief, the first rays of twilight pierced his windows and shone upon the pale blue paper on which he had just traced his justification of providence. It was about five o'clock in the morning when a slight noise reached his ear, which appeared like a stifled sigh. He turned his head, looked around him, and saw no one, but the sound was repeated distinctly enough to convince him of its reality. He arose and quietly opening the door of the drawing room, saw Haley, who had fallen on a chair with her arms hanging down and her beautiful head thrown back. She had been standing at the door to prevent his going out without seeing her, until sleep, which the young cannot resist, had overpowered her frame, wearied as she was with watching so long. The noise of the door did not awaken her, and Monte Cristo gazed at her with affectionate regret. She remembered she had a son, said he, and I forgot I had a daughter. Then shaking his head sorrowfully, poor Haley, said he. She wished to see me to speak to me. She had feared or guessed something. Oh, I cannot go without taking leave of her. I cannot die without confiding her to someone. He quietly regained his seat and wrote under the lines. I bequeath to Maximilian Morel, captain, the son of my former patron, Pierre Morel, ship owner at Marseille, the sum of 20 millions, a part of which may be offered to his sister Julia and brother-in-law Emmanuel. If he does not fear this increase of fortune may be, may mar their happiness. These 20 million are concealed in my grotto at Monte Cristo, of which Bertuccio knows the secret. If his heart is free, he will marry Hades, the daughter of Ali Pacha of Janina, whom I have brought up with the love of a father, and who has shown the love and tenderness of a daughter for me. He will thus accomplish, I don't say my last order, but my last desire. This will has already constituted Haiti heirs of the rest of my fortune, consisting of lands, founds in England, Australia, and Holland, furniture in my different places and houses, and which, without the twenty millions and the legacies to my servants, may still amount to sixty, sixty millions. He was finishing the last line when a cry behind him made him start. The pen fell from his hand. Haiti, said he, did you read it? Oh, my lord, said she, why are you writing such uh, thus at such an hour? Why are you bequeathing all your fortunes to me? Are you going to leave me? I am going on a journey, dear child, said Monte Cristo, with an expression of infinite tenderness and melancholy. If any misfortune should happen to me, the count stopped. Well, asked the young girl, with an authoritative tone the count had never observed before, and which startled him. Well, if any misfortunes happen to me, replied Monte Cristo, I wish my daughter to be happy. Haiti smiled sorrowfully and shook her head. Do you think of dying, my lord? said she. The wise man has said it. It is good to think about death, to think about death my child. Well, if you die, said she, bequeath your fortunes to others, for if you die, I shall require nothing. And taking the paper, she tore it in four pieces and threw it in the middle of the room. Then, the effort having exhausted her strength, she fell, not asleep this time, but fainting on the floor. The count leaned over her and raised her in his arms, and seeing that sweet pale face, those lovely eyes closed, that beautiful form motionless, and to all appearances lifeless, the idea occurred to him for the first time that perhaps she loved him otherwise than as a daughter loves a father. Alas, murmured he, with intense suffering, I might then have been happy yet. Then he earned Hedy to his to her room, resigned her to the care of her attendants, and returning to his cabinet, which he shut quickly this time. He again copied the destroyed will. As he was finishing, the sound of a cabriolet entered the yard was heard. Monte Cristo approached the window and saw Maximilian and Emmanuel alight. Good, said he, it was time and he sealed his will with three seals. One moment after, he heard a noise in the drawing room and went to open the door himself. Morel was there. 
He had come twenty minutes before the time appointed. I am perhaps come too soon, Count, said he, but I frankly acknowledge I have not closed my eyes all night, nor any one in my house. I required to see you strong in your courageous assurance, to recover myself. Monte Cristo could not resist this proof of affection. He not only extended his hand to the young man, but flew it to him with open arms. Morel, said he, it is a happy day for me to feel I am beloved by such a man as you. Good morning, Emmanuel. You will come in with me, then, Maximilian. Did you doubt it? said the young captain. But if I were wrong, I watched you during the whole scene of the challenge yesterday. I have been thinking of your firmness all night. And I said, justice must be on your side, or the man's countenance is no longer to be relied on. But Morel, Albert is your friend? A simple acquaintance, sir. You met on the same day you first saw me. Truly, but I should not have recollected it had, it had you not reminded me. Thank you, Morel. Then ringing the bell once. Look, said he to Ali, who came immediately. Take that to my solic solicitor. Solicitor. It is my will, Morel. When I am dead, you will go and examine it. What? said Morel. You dead? Yes. Y yes. Must I not be prepared for everything, dear friend? But what did you do yesterday after you left me? I went to Tortorni, where I expected. I found Beauchamp and Chateau Renaud. I own I was taking them. Why? When all was arranged. Listen, Count. The affair is serious and unavoidable. Did you doubt it? No, the offense was public, and everyone already talking about it. Well, well, I hoped I I hoped to get an exchange of arms, to substitute the sword for the pistol. The pistol is blind. Have you succeeded? Asked Monte Cristo quickly, with an imperceptible gleam of hope. No, for your skill with the sword is so well known. Ah, who has betrayed me? The skillful swordsman whom you have conquered, and you failed. They possibly, they positively refused. Morel said the count. Have you ever seen me fire a pistol? Never. Well, we have time. Look, Monte Cristo took the pistol he held in his hand when Mercedes entered, and fixing an ace of clubs against the iron plate, with four shots he successively shot off the four sides of the club. At each shot, Morel turned pale. He examined the balls with. Which Monte Cristo performed this dexterous feat, and saw they were no larger than deer shirt. It is astonishing," said he. "Look, Emmanuel." Then turning toward Monte Cristo, "Count," said he, "in the name of all that is dear to you, I entreat you not to kill Albert. The unhappy youth has a mother." "You are right," said Monte Cristo, "and I have none." These words were uttered in a tone which made Morrel shudder. "You are." The the offended party, Count. Doubtless. What does that imp What does that imply? That you will fire the first. I fire first. Oh, I obtained, or rather claimed, that we had conceded enough for them to yield us that. And at what distance? Twenty paces. A terrific smile passed over the Count's lips. Morrel said he, "Do not forget what you have just seen." The only chance for Albert's safety then will arise from your emotion. I suffer from emotion," said Monte Cristo, "or from your generosity, my friend. To so good a marksman as you are, I may say that you would appear absorbed to another. What is that? Break his arm, wound him, but do not kill him. I will tell you, Morrel," said the Count. "But I do not need entreating to spare the life of Monsieur de Morcerf." He shall be so well well spared, that he will return quietly with his two friends. While I, and you, that will be another thing. I shall be brought home. No, no," cried Maximilian, not knowing how to endure himself. As I told you, my dear Morrel, Monsieur de Morcerf will kill me. Morrel looked at him in utter unconsciousness. But what has happened then since last evening, Count? The same thing which happened to Brutus in the night before the Battle of Philippi. I have seen a phantom, and that phantom told me, Morel, I have lived long enough. Maximilian and Emmanuel looked at each other. Monte Cristo drew a, drew out his watch. Let us go," said he. "It is five minutes past seven, and the appointment was for eight o'clock." A carriage was in readiness at the door.
Monte Cristo stepped into it with his two friends. He had stopped a moment in the passage to listen at the door. And Maximilian and Emmanuel, who had considerably passed toward a few steps, thought they heard his answer by a sigh, a sob from within. As the clock struck eight, they drove up to the place of meeting. We are the first, said Morel, looking out of the window. Excuse me, sir, said Baptistin, who had followed his master with indescribable terror, but I think a carriage down there under the trees. Monte Cristo sprang lightly from the carriage and offered his hand to assist Emmanuel and Maximilian. The latter retained the Count's hand between his. I like, said he, to feel a hand like this when its owner relies on the goodness of his cause. Truly, said Emmanuel, I perceive two men down here who are evidently waiting. Monte Cristo drew Morel, not a sight, but a step or two behind his brother-in-law. Maximilian, said he, are you affections disengaged? Morel looked at Monte Cristo with astonishment. I do not seek your confidence, my dear friend. I only ask you a simple question. Answer it. That is all I require. I love a young girl, Count. Do you love her much? More than life. Another hope defeated, said the Count. Then with a sigh, poor Haiti, murmured he. In truth, Count, if I knew less of you, I should think you were less brave than you are. Because I sigh when thinking of someone I'm believing? Come, Morel, it is not like a soldier to be so bad a judge of courage. Do you regret life? What is it to me, who have passed twenty years between life and death? Moreover, do not alarm yourself, Morel. This weakness, if it is such, is betrayed to you alone. I know the world is a drawing room, from which we must retreat politely and honestly, that is, with a bow, and all debts of honor paid. That is the sub that is the, the that is to the purpose. Have you brought your arms? I? What for? I hope these gentlemen have theirs. I will inquire, said Morel. Do, but no compromises, you understand me? You need not fear, Morel advanced toward Beauchamp and Chateau Renaud, who, seeing his, effect, seeing his intention, came to meet him. The three young people bowed to each other courteously, if not affably. Excuse me, gentlemen, said Morel. But I do not. I do not see Monsieur de Morcerf. He sent us a word this morning," replied Chateau Renaud, "that he would meet us on the ground." Ah," said Morel. Beauchamp pulled off his watch. "It is only five minutes past eight," said he to Morel. "There is not much time lost yet." "Oh, I made no illusion of that kind," replied Morel. "There is a carriage coming," said Chateau Renaud. It advanced rapidly along one of the avenues. Leading toward the open space where they were assembled, you are doubtless provided with pistols, gentlemen," said Morel. Monsieur de Monte Cristo yielded his light of using his. We had anticipated this kindness on the part of the count," said Beauchamp, "and I have brought some arms which I bought eight or ten days since, thinking to want them on a similar occasion. They are quite new and have not yet been used. Will you examine them?" Oh, Monsieur Beauchamp," replied Morel with a bow. "If you assure me Monsieur de Morcerf does not know these arms, you may readily believe your word will be quite sufficient." "Gentlemen," said the Chateau Renaud, "is it not Morcerf coming in that carriage? Faith, it is France and Debray." The two young men he announced were indeed approaching. "What chance bring you here, gentlemen?" said the Chateau Renaud, shaking hands with each of them. "Because," said Debray. Albert sent this morning to request us to come. Beauchamp and Chateau Renaud exchanged looks of, asto of astonishment. I think um, I understand his reason, said Morel. What is it? Yesterday afternoon I received a letter from Monsieur de Morcerf begging me to attend the opera. And I, and I also, said Franz. And we too, added Beauchamp and Chateau Renaud. Having wished you all to witness the challenge, he now wishes you to be present at the combat. Exactly so," said the young man. "You have probably guessed right. But after all these arrangements, he does not come himself," said Chateau Renaud. "Albert is ten minutes after time." "There he comes," said Beauchamp, on horseback at full gallop, followed by a servant. "How imprudent," said Chateau Renaud, "to come on horseback to fight with a pistol, after all instructions I had given him." "And besides," said Beauchamp, with a collar above his cravat. 
an open coat with white waistcoat. Why has he not painted a spot <laughs> upon his heart? It would have been more simple. Meanwhile, Albert had arrived within 10 paces of ground formed by the five young men. He jumped off his horse, threw the bri bridle in his servant's arms, and joined them. He was pale, and his eyes were red with unswollen. It was evident he had not slept. A shade of melancholy gravity overspread his calmness, which was not natural to him. I thank you, gentlemen, said he, for having complied with my request. I feel extremely grateful for this remark of friendship. Morel had stepped back as Morsef approached and remained at a short distance. And to you also, Monsieur Morel, my thanks are due. Come, there cannot be too many. Sir, said Maximilian, you are not perhaps aware that I am Monsieur de Monte Cristo's friend. I am not sure, but I expected it. So much the better. The more honorable men there are here, be the better I shall be satisfied. Monsieur Morel, said Chateau Renaud, will you apprise the Count of Monte Cristo that Monsieur de Morcerf is arrived and are at his command? Morel is preparing to fulfill his commission. Beauchamp had meanwhile drawn a box of pistols from the carriage. Stop, gentlemen, said Albert. I have two words to say to the Count of Monte Cristo. In private? No, sir, before all who are here. Albert's seconds looked at each other. Franz and the Briggs changed some words in whisper. Morel, rejoiced at this unexpected incident, went to fetch the Count, who was walking in a retired path with Emmanuel. What does he want with me? said Monte Cristo. I don't know, but he wishes to speak to you. Ah, said Monte Cristo. I trust he is not going to attempt me by some fresh insult. I don't think such is his is a ugh. I don't think such is his intention, said Morel. The Count advanced, accompanied by Maximilian and Emmanuel. His calm and serene look, look formed a singular contrast to Albert's grief-stricken face, who approached also, followed by the four young people. When at three paces distant, Albert and the Count stopped. Approach, gentlemen, said Albert. I wish you not to lose one word of what I am about to have the honor of saying to the Count of Monte Cristo. For it must be repeated by all, by you to all who will listen to it, strange as it may appear to you. Proceed, sir, said the Count. Sir, said Albert, at first with a tremulous voice, but which gradually became firmer, I reproached you with exposing the conduct of Monsieur de Morcerf in Epirus, for guilty as I knew he was, I thought you had no right to punish him, but I have since learned you have that right. It is not Fernand Monaco's treachery toward Ali Pacha which induces me so ready to excuse you, but the treachery of the fisherman Fernand toward you, and the almost unheard of miseries which were its consequences. And I say, and proclaim it publicly, that you were justified in revenging yourself on my father, and I, his son, thank you for not using greater severity. Had a thunderbolt fallen in the midst of the spectators of this unexpected scene, it would not have surprised these men more than did Albert's declaration. As for Monte Cristo, his eyes slowly rose toward heaven with an expression of infinite gratitude. He could not understand how Albert's fiery nature, of which he had seen so much among the Roman bandits, had suddenly stopped to this humiliation. He recognized the influence of Mercedes and saw why her noble heart had not opposed to the sacrifice she knew beforehand would be useless. Now, sir, said Albert, if you think my apology is sufficient, pray give me your hand, next to the merit of infallibility which you appear to possess. I rank that of candidly acknowledging a fault. But this confession concerns me only. I acted well according to the laws of man, but you have acted according to those of God. An angel alone could have saved one of us from death. That angel came from heaven, if not to make us friends, which, alas, fatality renders impossible, at least to make us esteem each other. Monte Cristo, with moistened eyes, half breast, and lips half open, extended Albert a hand, which the latter pressed with a sentiment resembling a respect, resembling respectful fear. Gentlemen, said he, Monsieur de Monte Cristo receives my apology. I acted hastily toward him. Hasty actions are generally bad ones. Now my fault is, re is repaired. I hope the world will not call me cowardly for acting as my conscience dictated. But if any one 
should entertain a false opinion of me, added he, drawing himself up as if he would challenge both friends and enemies. I shall endeavor to correct his mistake. What then happened during the night? asked Beauchamp of Chateau Renaud. We appear to make a very sorry figure here. In truth, what Albert has just done is either very despicable or very noble, replied the baron. What can it, what can it mean? said the brilliant to France. The Count of Monte Cristo acts dishonorably to Monsieur de Morcerf and is justified by his son. Had I ten Janinas in my family, I should only consider myself the more bound to fight ten times. As for Monte Cristo, his head was bent down, his arms were powerless, falling under the weight of twenty-four years' reminiscence. He thought not of Albert, of Beauchamp, of Chateau Renaud, or of any of that group, but he thought of that courageous woman who had come to plead for her son's life, to whom he had offered his, and who had not saved it by the revelation of a dreadful family secret, capable of destroying forever, in that young man's heart, every feeling of filial piety. Provide and still, murmured he. Now only I am, am I, fully convinced of being the emissary of God.